Thank you for auditing the always positive New Music Review Show hosted by a French professor who is not going to finish this review. I don't know how long it's going to be. I know I have 16 pages of notes, which is a lot. You know how long it's going to be. Uh, but no matter how long it is, I don't know if there's really any good time to release a review of an album so dense and so rich as Billy Wood's Ethiopes. So I'm just going to say that right up front. Okay, I'm going to do my best. I held this review off until Thursday, even though I've wanted to review it earlier. I want to give myself as much time to figure out all the intertextual elements, all of the references, and I feel like I've done a pretty good job. I think you're going to learn something about the album, if you love the album. I think you're going to have some good insights as to what makes it so good. Uh, but um, it would be a disservice to claim that this is anything other than a rough draft. Let's just start with the title and the cover of the album. Like, Ethiopes. Like, refer to, referring to Ethiopians? Maybe. And the cover. So, I talk a lot about the importance of art history. Um, if you are in college, and a lot of my viewers are in college, take an art history class. There's no excuse not to. It's one of the most important things you can do to become an educated person. It will make your life better because you'll have more interesting things to do when you go to museums as opposed to just... I don't know, getting drink or getting drunk or watching sports, uh, but it will really enrich your life and will help like you understand culture on a much higher level. So all that is a way to brag to say when I saw the cover of two sort of anonymous looking African faces, I go, that looks like Rembrandt. The 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 way it's shaded, the way it's painted, you know, this is a black and white version, but but I could sort of tell, you know, that that looks like Rembrandt. And so while I was looking up this painting, I just looked up Rembrandt African. And this is not some random painting that Billy Woods picked. I mean, there's one thing I've learned about Billy Woods is that uh, not only is he very smart, but he's, you know, sm smarter than you, smarter than me. <laughs> you know, he's, he's that kind of smart. You know, you don't get a lot of musicians like that, but he's that kind of smart. This is not some random reference. This is very intentional and it fits the theme of the album. Now, first of all, this is from 1661. Now, that is my century of specialty. You know, I, I mainly study France, but that's the 17th century. But still, you know, Rembrandt, this is a pretty rare painting. I mean, as far as depictions of, of at black people or Africans at that point, they were almost always like, you'll have Balthazar, the king, or you will have a slave. But a painting like this of just two African men, not quite finished, but nearly finished, is fairly remarkable. <clears throat> I mean, if you look at it, he really does succeed in, in depicting in the physiognomy and the expressions, and it's, it's done with a level of care and respect that he gives to all of his other subjects. But what I found interesting, I'm, I'm actually going to put that up here for you to look at in the background. Well, I got this new uh, fuzzy focus thing going. Tell me, tell me what you think about it. I don't know. I got a new phone, so I got to justify the cost. I did a little bit of research, and there isn't that much written about this painting, uh, which is odd because it's Rembrandt, and it's even more odd because uh, the academic world is frantically trying to find examples of representation of not just dead white guys in the canon. But I found a really interesting article about not just this painting, but where it hangs, by somebody named Mira Demir Derek. I'll include a link to her article uh, in the description. And what she points out, is that this painting is in the same, uh, the same museum, the uh, Moritz Huys, where the girl with the pearl earring is. You know, the, the famous uh, Vermeer painting with the girl, and she's got the earring and she's looking back. So obviously that's the big star here. But what she points out is there's a placard somewhere in the museum, which briefly mentions, where do you think the money came for this museum? If it's the Moritz Huys, Moritz Huys must be named after the benefactor, the person who the museum is named after. Oh, he was a great benefactor of the arts, a great cultural figure, who also was a colonial overlord in Brazil. Where did the money come from in Brazil? Oops, <laughs> he did a slavery. He started the transatlantic slave trade in Brazil for the Dutch. 
That's the kind of context which I am positive is not coincidental, is not some kind of like, oh, well, you know, I guess he just saw this cool image of black dudes and put it on the cover of his album. That tension between historical slavery and representation and exotic, like it's all feeding into the themes of the album. And so I'm gonna go back to these two African men quite often throughout this, throughout this video. But what about the title, Ethiopia or Ethiopes? First of all, I think this is another art history thing. In general, when we see art, like representations of Africans in, uh, in art, you know, before the 19th century, before the 20th century, often they'll just be sort of described as Ethiopians or, or Moors, or sort of general terminology, which doesn't show a lot of the specificity, but it's just a general term. So I think that's part of it. But also Ethiopia itself in African history is an amazing place. It symbolizes a black autonomy. You know, there's a failed colonization by the Italians. It also represents poverty. It also represents um, a horrible dictatorship. It has sort of a lot of the, a lot of different elements of African history all in one country. And when we look at Billy Woods as a character, and I just, I need to say this, okay? I am not some Billy Woods expert. I have heard haram and this. I get comments like, every month, Sky, you gotta review the Moore Mother album. You gotta review it. I'm sure it's great, I'm positive. I'm positive I'm an idiot for not reviewing it, but I haven't. So this is my first Billy Woods solo project I'm reviewing. But I've learned a lot from this and I'm gonna share what I've learned anyway. So his story, based on my small research, is really a lot about the story of African African Americans. And that's a very underrepresented group in hip hop. That's a very underrepresented group in the world. African Americans who are also African. His mother was an English professor, which I'm trying to think, you know, I am a professor, right? I'm in my office right now. That's where I actually am. Um, how many <laughs> musicians are children of professors? I can only think of three and they're all rappers. Kanye, Earl Sweatshirt, and now Billy Woods. Please tell me in the comments if there's others I'm not thinking of. So, you know, that's sort of the, the American side. Uh, and in that way, I think he probably does a good job, like those other two artists, of representing an underrepresented group in hip hop, which is black middle class rappers, you know, using the voice of the voiceless to be the voice of the voiceless, even if they're not rapping about themes of poverty, right? Like those voices are still very needed, are still very hushed, are barely heard in our society. We need those voices. But then his father was a Zimbabwean revolutionary and politician. And if you want to lose a couple hours of research on your own, I suggest you look up about the Zimbabwe, uh, the Rhodesian Bush War, all about the history of decolonization of Zimbabwe and, and England. It's more interesting than whatever video game you're going to play. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that. Uh, it's better than Elden Souls or whatever the hell it's called. So already, just on that level, we have someone who is primed for intellectual excellence by having a professor as a parent. I'm sorry, that sounds arrogant, but it's true. My kids are primed for, <laughs> for intellectual excellence because of the kind of household that you have when your, your parent is a professor. But then we also have this international blackness. And this is something which we normally only see in, in European hip hop. And it's all over European hip hop especially French, especially British hip hop, where the connection to Africa is a lot more direct. So the, the, the themes of what was coined by uh, Aimé Césaire uh, as negritude, sort of international black movement, which seeks to destroy the national divisions and sort of uh, group together the international black experience under one. I think we see that in Billy Woods' work, but he does it in such a way that I'm only going to just glance the surface. Because I've just spent a week with this album, so I'm sorry. You're gonna have to wait for the Billy Woods book, which someone is going to write. I hope that someone is watching this who's going, you know, I should like take hip hop seriously. I should try studying it in college. I hope you do it. I hope you write a book about Billy Woods' art. I hope you do the research to really give this album <laughs> the respect that it deserves. And I hope you take this video as partial inspiration. So in this album, it's drenched in these themes, but they're poetic. The thing about his style is that he's very, 
He's not very didactic. He's not very preachy. He talks about these themes, but he talks about them, you know, rapping, so very quickly and, and rhyming and all that, but also like kind of obliquely. He puts a lot of the work on you to do the research or me to do the research, and then I will help you to do the research, even if it's just surface level at this point. So he's very politically engaged without being particularly uh, preachy. And the themes that I see that come out of this album are these hints, this sort of multi-century international themes of blackness. I'm talking colonization, the slave trade, and the dehumanization that comes from exoticism. Okay? Please remember, the word exotic is the N-word. Okay? The word exotic never means anything good. The word exotic is always a premise for genocide. If you don't know what I'm talking about, a guy named Edward Said has written some good books. I suggest you find them and read them. I'll get into that more in a second, though, so, so don't worry. If, if that sentence confuses you because, you know, you saw some guy and you thought he was hot and then he said, oh, he's so exotic, I'll explain to you why that's problematic soon enough. And matched with all these themes is a sort of modern commentary on the modern slavery of hyper-free market capitalism, of the wealth gap, of the world that we live in. So all of these things are all together, but they're all done by a great poet. You know, I, I have a sort of long meditation about how poetic should hip hop be, how separate should we keep hip hop from poetry. Uh, I don't think it really matters in this case. And what I particularly like is in a, in a couple cases on this album, he shows himself to be a master storyteller. Now storytelling in hip hop, you know, Slick Rick to Nas, you know, those are the, those are the greats. I think Billy Woods belongs there too, for a couple times on this album where he manages to sort of tell stories almost with a sort of magical realism to them, like, like a bizarre sort of like confessional personal side while also being political. It's just an amazing trick and one I've never heard before. I've never heard this kind of storytelling. His flow is good, it has, it's not, like his flow is not amazing, like that's not why I would listen to him, but I do like how he's able to sort of vary his flow by varying levels of emphasis and sort of going between kind of talking versus yelling. The whole album is produced by one person, and that's great, DJ Preservation. Never heard of him, okay? So just feel free to fill my comments with Sky, you ignorant moron. Go ahead, because Whoever the hell DJ Preservation is, uh, he is great. <laughs> There's so, like, first of all, this album is so, and this is a word I love to use, but it's important. I review albums, I don't review songs. It's so cohesive. This whole thing feels like one idea, production-wise, and every song flows into the next. And the instrumentation is unexpected. It doesn't sound like anything else. I mean, it fits within the general underground hip hop sound that we have now, but there's a lot of non-traditional instruments. And apparently the album that he released a couple years ago that I somehow missed was entirely composed of Chinese samples, even though this dude's from New York. So that, that status as an international crate digger, as somebody who goes that deep into the crates, into the international crates, is totally natural that he would make something so good. So this pairing is, I mean, I loved Haram, um, but I think I, I think I like this even more, uh, just in the way that it's such a well-conceived and difficult to parse album. It's that depth. It's that fact that I don't think I'm actually all the way there yet that makes me love it so much. So let's get to the album. When I can, I like to provide an example song of the album for you to listen to, get a sense of what it's like. And it's great if it's the first song as it is in this case with the song Richness. I'll include a link to it up there. Or in the fuzzy. Is this, this is cool. This looks cool to me, but I don't know if it looks good to you. You tell me. There's the stamp and it's called Asylum. Oh my God. The richness and the depth to this song. You know, like it's somewhat inscrutable, but it's also totally clear. Production-wise, it's kind of this jazzy guitar 
tinkling intro, which then segues into a sort of haphazard sounding beat that totally works as a bed for his voice. And then eventually a bass comes in, then eventually the drums. And then we have this opening line, I think Mangisto Haile Mariam is my neighbor. Immediately, okay, get, get to YouTube, look up the history of Ethiopia, get to Wikipedia, do what you want. Mariam is a fascinating figure. A, an African dictator. African dictators are super important to this. I'm going to be talking a lot about African dictators on this review. He was an African dictator of Ethiopia. He was a war criminal. Killed over 500,000 people in the name of communism. I think Mengistu Haile Mariam is my neighbor. So there's so much in this information in this one sentence, because he's talking about the part of his life where he lived in Zimbabwe. And if you know, Mariam was exiled and lived in asylum in Zimbabwe. So immediately, he's making it clear to those of us who are paying attention, if an international war criminal is living next door to you, you probably live in a good place, <laughs> okay? International war criminals live well, all right? If they're not in The Hague awaiting trial, they usually have a mansion. They're usually kept in happy ca captivity. So he's telling this story, and so you immediately place him, you know, like we're not talking about Zimbabwe, we're not talking about a shanty town, we're not talking about poverty, we're talking about the upper class. Whoever it is moved in and put an automated gate up repainted brick walls atop which now cameras rotated. So he gives this whole description of living next to this war criminal, or maybe a war criminal, he doesn't know. But then this is an example of that storytelling, of passing from the political to the personal. Some nights, Watry well, describes him sitting out on the veranda drinking whiskey, which I think is a great detail of, of this war criminal who lives next door to him. Some nights, Strange music plays, I lay in bed and listen. Downstairs, my mother's breaking dishes, my father tripping. So he may be in a comfortable place in Zimbabwe, but he's still next to a murderer and upstairs from his fighting family. This theme of marital strife between the professor and the revolutionary, between his parents, is one of the most important themes here. And we see he wants to escape. His bodyguard chews Cot, which is uh, this like addictive substance that is chewed in many different parts of the country. Uh, QAT is also a good word in Scrabble because it doesn't use a U. Spits black in the rhododendron. There's going to be a couple times where I'm going to go out on a limb. I think this is on purpose that he says rhododendron. It could be that he did spit in a rhododendron, but I think you're thinking about Zimbabwe. You're thinking about its old name of Rhodesia. And I think rhododendron and Rhodesia are supposed to be in your head at the same time. I am never going to sell Billy Wood short <laughs> based on the two albums that I've reviewed. I'm assuming this is a, not an Easter egg, but a sort of thematic thing to link in your head. If you, if you know history and you know the word Rhodesia and you know that's where we are, and then you hear rhododendron, Rhodesia, rhododendron, Blacked out range, rumble when you start the engine, avocado tree hot, hang above the property line. I watch from as high as I can climb. So he's watching his neighbor. The dog looks up and whines. The hills are alive with landmines. So this is probably a reference to that civil war, not that civil war, the decolonization war against the British. Not sure what I'm looking for, but I know when I'll find. Mother sent the gardener to look for me, but the sky is a great place to hide. What a crazy, beautiful line. For I don't quite get it, but I get it. He's trying to escape. He's trying to see what's happening. He's a child who's kind of lost, who's kind of confused. And meanwhile, the entire drama of decolonization and dictatorship is all playing out right next to him with the mines in the hills because he can't run to the hills because he might step on a landmine. Hey, what's your life like? Did you grow up thinking that you might step on a landmine? My wife did. I didn't. And then there's a crazy chorus. A crazy chorus. The, the saxophone is so, 
so loud. It's the most avant-garde part of, well, second most avant-garde part of the album. I'll get to another one later. It's just so loud to the point where I had to take out my headphones the first time I listened to it. Uh, you, you never, you know, you told, you never told the truth in your entire life. Can't start now. Then the second verse has this whole theme of like guests in the house, and we had this image of a party happening there. Haven is only safe as they want you around. It seems to be a question of the nature of exile, of how how um, he can only be Mariam can only be comfortable in Zimbabwe as long as the Zimbabweans want him there. Deep stuff. It's about exile, but it's not just about his exile. It's about the exile and the asylum that Billy feels. Like they're both prisoners in this nice upper class part of Zimbabwe, which no matter how upper class and nice it is, still has mines in the hills. They still can't get out. Then, oh my dear auditors, do I have homework for you. Maybe you've already done this. If you haven't, I'm, I'm gonna insist. There's a quote from a movie. Kongi's Harvest. Nigerian movie. You cannot understand this album if you haven't watched the movie. Okay? So, you love, you love this album? You're, you're, a, you're a Billy Woods stan? You, you, you feel about Billy Woods the way my daughter feels about Billy Eilish, right? You just gotta watch this movie. I got good news for you. <laughs> it's streaming for free on YouTube. Just look up Kongi's Harvest with a K. K-O-N-G-I apostrophe S Harvest. It is a great piece of African cinema. It is a great piece of world cinema. It is a great piece of cinema, period. The quote that's used here is an important quote because it's a, the whole movie is about, about a yam festival. If you've ever studied Kendrick Lamar, you know the importance of yams in African culture. So there's a country, an imaginary country, Isma, and there's a king who's been deposed by a dictator and the king is kept in captivity, and that's where this quote is. You see how well they treat me? He's in captivity. But in order to get the sort of spiritual approval of the country, the dictator needs the king to allow him to bless the yams. That's the question. The dictator and the king. The dictator representing brutality in the name of national autonomy and progress, and the king representing backwards ways, representing uh, polygamy, representing superstition and religion, but also representing a lot of the will of the people. So this kind of conflict is playing out throughout the entire movie. Two African men. I think that's part of what, why this, this image was chosen. It was written by Wole so uh, Soyinka, who's the first African to win a Nobel Prize in Literature. He also stars as the dictator. Is directed by Ossie Davis, the, the American actor, the character actor who's like in almost all the early Spike Lee movies. And the movie is just great. It's a great, engaging movie. It's a satire. It's a parody. It's a political commentary. It's funny. It's interesting. It's challenging. It's eye-opening. It's about the nature of African revolution, about revolution itself about this dictator versus the king, about traditional religions versus Marxist doctrine. It's about exile. It's about captivity. It's about being pacified. It's about inter-African struggle. It's about the ridiculousness and the cruelty of the dictator and the ridiculousness of the king. All of these things are all together in this movie, and this movie is sampled like 10 times. Okay, not 10. I think it's six. I believe six. I believe six times throughout this album. So watch the movie. I'll include a link in the description for you to watch whoever uploaded this movie. If it gets taken down, just rent it on Amazon. It's two bucks. It's really worth it. How many movies from Africa have you seen? I'd seen maybe five. Not many. And this is a very good one. And it's really important that on this first song, with this theme of Ethiopia, this theme of Africa, this theme of dictatorship, where obviously the dictator is like a Miriam-style character, and this passage and this conflict. <sighs> well, as long as I'm not 25 minutes into the video and I haven't gotten past the first song. Oh, I have? <laughs> All right. Whew. It's gonna take a little breath here. I have like so many books to get to. I have so much going on here. 
segues perfectly into the next song, No Hard Feelings. Almost more of a breathless flow here from Billy Woods, talking about being a black astronaut, cop a spacesuit and jet off my steps, challenger launch, burn and bright, burnt to death. This might be, I think, a continuation of the last, out, last song, the idea of hiding in the sky. And there's also a whole um, monologue in the movie about, about space being nothingness, about space not representing progress. I think that might be intentional. I get the sense that Billy Woods and DJ Preservation watched this movie five times before making the album. There's a weird droning sound in the back, which, you know, I I'm of Scottish ancestry, so I am assuming it's bagpipes. It's not bagpipes. It's some kind of droning instrument. So I just showed my, uh, my cultural prejudice there. And then nice tinkling pianos in the back and this theme uh, of just no hard feelings, constantly repeated. And then there's a little bit of his flow. You know, I, I, I kind of downplayed his flow there a little bit, but let's, let's take a little second to, to, to really appreciate it. It starts to come back from the grave again and again, grinning, it's winning, it's winning, it's winning, it's winning. Brother hopped out that new car smelling like no hard fillings. Aftertaste, bitter melon and lemon, pil lemon pillings. Heat rises, so it's high ceilings. Just very interesting, like the peeling, filling, winning, grinning, sealing. Just listen to that little bit and you hear really some of the best flow on the album. Next, and then it ends with kind of like this cool flute solo. And then we get to the song, War Wharves? Wharves. W-H-R-V-E-S. You know, like a wharf. It's a, it's a plural of a wharf. I'm going to do the door of the Explorer thing. Can you say wharves? Very good. Nice sort of bell sounds. Reminds me a little bit of the ocean, you know, like a, like a, like a sea bell. And then almost kind of like a, a kettle drum and then there's a great drum beat that comes underneath. This is maybe my favorite example of the album of the interaction between Billy's voice and, and Preservation's uh, production. Just there's this amazing sound between it. And then we start to get into some of these other themes of the album. So we've had, you know, the first couple of tracks which seem to be about African leadership and, uh, and exile and, and personal strife. This feels to be about a lot of the justification for colonization and the justification for slavery. There's a little two song section here, which I think we need to talk about. Cannibal tours that came in all fours, waterborne eyes like jaws. So cannibal tours, it's, you know, I mean, like, like if we look at some of the, the imagery, like this great book by, uh, by Aldrich here uh, about coloniz French colonization, these are the kinds of images which we'd often see. Uh, used to justify, you know, the, the strong civilized white man and the black people in the backwards, uh, being backwards in the back. It's also like this idea that Africa was a place that was filled with backwards cannibals. And so talking about cannibal tours, I think is important. And there's even a quote at the end with some Germans talking in German about colonization. And the thing is, the justification for colonization is the civilizing mission, that's the term that's used. Saving the savages, those are the terms that are used. Which makes sense that the next song is then called Sauvage, which is in French. This is not a coincidence. I gotta go to Montaigne, one of my favorite French philosophers and writers and thinkers in the 16th century, okay? In the 16th century, before the 17th century, he wrote this whole series of essays and in it, he actually described cannibals, and he talked about cannibalism and the European obsession with cannibalism. But what made Montaigne so interesting and cool was that he didn't think it was a big deal. Or more specifically, he was insistent that what we consider to be bar barbarous is anything that is not in our habit. So that there is nothing really savage except that which goes against our, our nature. You know, so a French kid will eat a snail, but will never eat a marshmallow. Not never, but we'll never eat a s'more. I tried to give a French kid a s'more once and he wouldn't eat it. I tried to give an American kid a snail once and he wouldn't eat it. That's savagery. There's a particular quote in here, which I find interesting, which I'm going to read to you and translate at the same time. Um, I think that there is more savage, there's more barbarism 
and eating a man alive than eating a man when he's dead. To tear apart by torments and by tortures a body that is still full of feeling than to put it on the menu. So, so it's worse to torture and to kill somebody while they're still living than it is to eat a, a person who has died. That's Montaigne. And it's interesting because we're really getting into the themes of what is savagery. So all these themes are all coming together and they're all mixed up. And it's, there's not a straight line. There's not a straight line between like, he's not telling the story of Africa and colonization and exploitation in a straight line. It's all mixed up. Now this beat is maybe my favorite beat here. There's like a tinkling timpani sounds. And then like every once in a while, there's this guitar note that sounds like a beep. And one of my favorite things that music can do is have like a very remarkable sound that's a little bit hard to place rhythmically. My kids and I love to identify when that sound comes. So I was driving my daughter back from crew practice and I was driving, just getting on to 590, uh, 490 actually, and we were driving and it was just really fun because bang, we try to time ourselves with that sound. Now this is one of the first kind of posse cuts on the album, which is to say lots of rappers on it. Boldy James starts with a beautiful verse. Our father who art in heaven, all a uh, end worship, moving at a slow pace. I used to get discouraged, all gas, no brakes, never did reverse it. Freestyling on that road, never did rehearse it. Our janky promoters tour through the Chit Chitlin circuit. Just a great line from Boldy James, who really, like the way he interplays with Billy's voice is nice. Uh, a slight change halfway through the second verse. Um, and then just these lines, like, oh, okay. Central American Ubermenches in the bed of a pickup building prefab duplexes, human traffic like the Department of Corrections, godless savages, fish bone necklaces. I just don't know how to, Central American Ubermenches, so is that referring to the Nazis who escaped to Central America? I don't know. In the bed of a pickup, is this actually about people leaving, like fleeing their countries? Prefab duplexes, human traffic, like the Department of Corrections, like a comment on the jail system being like human traffickers, but also like people in the bed of a hiccup. Is this like about the migrant caravan? All this together, God the savages. Is this about us trying to empathize with the migrants who obviously need to sympathize because the reason that they're fleeing their countries for the most part is because of our war on drugs and because of our appetite for drugs? I don't know. Okay, Billy, you got me. I can't... <laughs> I can just throw it out there. This might be an amazing verse about the dehumanization of Central American uh, exiles in a way that's similar to the way that we uh, dehumanized Africans to justify the mistreatment on both sides by treating them as godless savages. Is this a big comment about the migrant caravan and Tucker Carlson uh, and tying it all together with the enslavement of Africans and the colonizations of Africa? I don't know. I don't know. But it could be. And the more I'm thinking about, the more I think it probably is. But that's the beauty of Billy Woods' work is it's not that clear. It's in that world, but kind of like the images that are now behind me with this weird cinematic <laughs> filming style, it's not 100% clear what's being said. I really like how the, savage, the, the idea of sauvage is played up in the chorus and that rhymes with dommage. And then it kind of plays out and leads into the song, The Doldrums. Oh my God, this, this guy. Th 33 minutes in and I haven't even talked about doldrums yet and I haven't even got to Christine yet. I, yeah, I have papers to grade, Billy. Like I have like a stack of essays to grade. I came into I came into campus to give myself some time to grade them, but I'm gonna be talking about your awesome album for the next who knows how long. Well, you know how long. The Doldrums, amazing beat, like a harpsichord, very sparse and cool. The whole album, the production is always very sparse with things appearing as time goes on. In this case, a guitar and a bass, the sound of a scratchy vinyls in the background. And The Doldrums is a specific place in the Atlantic where like, it's very calm, but also unpredictable. Well, what's he talking about? Well, I mean, this dude's African. 
Uh, he's American. He's African American. He's both. He's very politically conscious. So if we're talking about a boat in the Atlantic, we're probably in the world of the slave trade. But are we? I can't tell. It seems that we are and we aren't. Because there's also references to the plug, to the drug trade. Is this another weird combination with the song that was previous talking about the migrants and about South America and Central America and the dehumanization of these people who are trying to flee a drug war that we both create and execute? Maybe, maybe this is a large connection between the slave trade and free market capitalism and the way that in both cases, the people who lose look like those people in that wonderful painting by Rembrandt that hangs in a museum named in the honor of a person who took those wonderful people and put them in chains and dragged them to America to make sugar, molasses, and rum. The moon float, horses thrown overboard, kick fast and slow, it don't matter which, thick mist, piff smoke, draw straws from clenched fists. So when you're in the doldrums, uh, this uh, lyric genius helped me out with this, rap genius helped me out with this, I guess they would often kick horses off to try to lighten the load and also take straws to lighten the load. Human souls in the hull. That can only be a slave reference. Sinking, sinking ship, human souls in the hull. He's got the whole world in his hands, ice cold. Open the palms up, turn black as a ghost. Draw, you know, so like, they're gonna be throwing somebody overboard and it seems to be him but it's very complicated because it's also the human souls in the hull, which is also the slave trade. And then later he talks about being very good in tight spaces. And if you know anything about the, the transatlantic slave trade, human beings were trafficked like wood. They're just stacked on top of each other. It was terrible. But then it seems to be about like, you better be careful because if you don't have the money, then the plug is going to get you. So it could be that this is a drug trafficking ship or a human trafficking ship. And as the previous song made clear, it's all part of the same system. And then this beautiful chorus, nothing ever happened till it do, waterproof boots like new, mom shook her head, shouldn't wear a dead man's shoes. I don't get this. I sort of get it. I kind of get it. I sort of get this theme, you know, like bad things don't happen until they do and waterproof boots, like you're prepared for it, but then you're also wearing dead man's shoes. Great harmonica all the way throughout this weird sample that's being used here and this this guitar that's like kind of hammered on notes, it's great. But I gotta move on. I gotta move on to 9X. <sighs> First of all, 9X, that's a name, that's a blast from the past. When I was growing up, there was, there, was, there was a couple things that happened. All of the banks became one bank and all of the phone companies became one company. So when I was growing up, there was Bank of Boston and there was Bay Bank and then eventually that became Fleet Bank and eventually that became Chase and just bop, 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 cat, you know, bam just monopoly. I grew up after the breakup of the AT&T Bell service where, where all of the telecommunications were owned by one company and then they were broken up and then throughout my whole life, they've all just been congealing into one again. So there was New York Telephone and there was New England Telephone and then they merged and became 9X. They merged with Bell and then GTE to become Verizon. So like all these things, so this word 9X is very evocative of a particular time in New York, in Massachusetts, of when phones were that. I think it's about capitalism. It seems to be that it is. Nice kind of stuttering sound, very menacing bass, more odd harmonicas. The slave master's children all looked identical. True, the future is children, but whatever future you're building already look miserable. I don't know if this is a comment on the miserableness of, uh, of humanity or the miserableness of inheriting that inheritance of slavery. And the drums come in for the chorus. And then here, I just, I'm telling you, this is why it's a rough draft. Because there appears to be a reference to Ak, which would be Akhenaten, which would be the Egyptian god. And as you know, um, a historian named Diop has been working really hard to really valorize Egypt studies as African studies. I've talked about this in the past. French rappers in particular, the group I am, are very insistent about this, that we need to think of Egyptian history, not as Egyptian history, but as part of African history. And then even later, Denmark Vesey in his verse mentions the Egyptian alphabet, Medu Neter. 
so this could be about this general tendency to re this desire to re-Africanize Egypt. I can't quite tell. Kel Chris has this beautiful voice. He has a whole verse on here. <laughs> Lots of cool like references to Peabody and Sherman, uh, Laverne and Shirley. Uh, has a funny line. There's no cap. That's no cap and all caps at the same time. Uh, just a, a good line. And just a very odd chorus. It's not my favorite song. It's another kind of posse cut, but it's probably not my favorite song because I just, I don't, not only do I not get it, I don't sort of like think I'm on the way to getting it because I don't quite understand this Egyptian thing about Akhenaten having a plan. But not to worry. We're then going to lead into Christine featuring Mike Ladd. This song, it's, a very, it's an echo of the first song because it mixes together the fantastical and the real mixes together the personal and the political. Um, it's a weird kind of ominous string noise, almost sounds like a horror song, and, and it's, you know, Christine is a horror book by Stephen King about a haunted car. And the whole thing starts off, black car on a back street, little me alone in the back seat, lulled by street lamps and the blackness in between. First of all, that's just great poetry. <laughs> I'm going to read that again. I don't care if I'm 40 minutes into this video. You're this far. Black car on a black... Black car on a back street. Little me asleep on the back seat. Lulled by the street lamps and the blackness in between. Do you remember being in the back of the car sleeping? I do. My parents' argument picking up speed in and out of bad dreams. So we have this image of this kid who's trying to sleep almost asleep, being awoken by the domestic disputes that have been going on for the entire album. And then eventually this haunted car makes his, this appearance, like these black wings in, in the neighborhood. And then the chorus quotes a song that I've been listening to for 20 years. So this is now the part where we have to talk about Lee Scratch Perry, who's one of the most important producers of music in human history. He was a reggae producer, one of the founders of sort of dub music and uh, kind of deeper, grimier, nice, great reggae from the 60s and 70s. He worked a lot with Bob Marley in the early days, and there's a song they have called Mr. Brown. Now, I've known this song forever. I love this song. That's my favorite era of Bob Marley. Uh, Mr. Brown rides around town in a coffin, right? So it's this whole story about, uh, about Mr. Brown driving in a coffin. So it's a, it's a Jamaican sort of folk tale, a kind of urban legend about a coffin that drives around. And I've been listening to this chorus forever, and I always thought it was from finding to the sight of it, when actually what they're saying is from Mandeville to Sligoville. So thanks to this Billy Wood song, I now know the chorus to Mr. Brown, which I've been singing for 20 years. And it's a direct quote and a direct reference to this kind of urban superstition and then there's a whole verse about like this car being hidden by a, a by a criminal in his grandmother's yard, and then he gets shot, and then the car gets overtaken, and that's the car that ends up. So it's also about like the the, the history of crime, and I would say incarceration, and of um, black murder and black death, and the the haunting of a killed criminal who was obviously killed trying to get money, trying to live in this desperate situation. Now that's why the Mr. Brown myth works so well because it's this figure of urban fear. <sighs> and then there's this, this whole line, inflatable sky dancer said, no money down. Every sign said, if you lived here, you'd be home now. So we had this sort of image of this kid in the back of the car who's like seeing all these, all this haunted coffin that's driving around. And then he sees a wacky waving inflatable arm flailing tube man flying around saying no money down. And then if you lived here, you'd be home now. Now, I, I, you know, I, I grew up in Boston, and uh, uh, on Starro Drive, they had a sign that said, if you lived here, you'd be home now. And I remember being a kid and seeing that and thinking that was the funniest thing I've ever seen. I was like, it's true. <laughs> if, if I lived here, I'd be home now. Then inexplicably, there's some quotes from Vin Scully, the, the Los Angeles Dodgers baseball player. And then we have Mike Ladd. Mike Ladd, who I'd never heard of, but... Um, uh, sounds like sounds like we could hang. <laughs> He's from Boston. I'm, I'm from Boston. He went to Hampshire College. 
I couldn't get into Hampshire College, but everyone I know who went to Hampshire College has always been much cooler than I am. And he lives in Paris. And I lived in Paris. And he has a great verse. It starts off with F23 and me talking about the genetic testing service, which all of the genetic stuff, all ancestry, all that stuff, I'm into, I'm interested too. I like, I like knowing that my ancestors used to kill each other back in Scotland. You know, the Campbells and the Laments, uh, Towered Castle, they killed each other. I'm interested in that stuff. But it's racist. It's racist for me to know that. It's racist for me to know my, my lineage because some parts of my lineage take dudes like that and drag them over to America and exploited them and cut them off from their culture. So F23 and me is a beautiful line. And then it gets even deeper. Mom's an inventor. From our DNA to Cambridge, Mass. Ma fe, that's Skippy, and Poule. <sighs> Last night, I was in bed. I was reading these lyrics. And I screamed out loud, no effing way. Because I think I figured this out. I think I figured this out, but I don't think there's, I think you have to have this shared knowledge that I have with Mike Ladd in order to get it. Mafe, if you don't know, it's a wonderful African dish, a peanut-based dish. So that's skippy, like peanut butter. You know, anything that's based on peanuts tastes a little peanut butter. And sometimes, not usually, but sometimes it's made with chicken. Poulet. Great. So that's just talking about what, what ma fe is. Great. Let's move on. One second. Did he say Cambridge Mass? He, say, he said Cambridge Mass. That's what Harvard is. He said Skippy. Skippy is not just peanut butter. Skippy is the nickname for the great, amazing black intellectual Henry Louis Gates Jr. Psst. Side anecdote, my father knew him when he was younger and encouraged him to keep, keep working. He, my dad was in West Virginia at the time. Doesn't matter. Henry Louis Gates lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts when the police arrested him in his own home because they thought he was a robber. Now listen, I hate, I hate the rhetoric that Boston is more racist than other cities because I think that lets other cities off the hook. <laughs> not because Boston's not racist. But arresting powerful and intelligent top-level academics in their house because they happen to be black is, as the kids would say, not a great look. So President Obama, in one of his most sort of impotent moments where he was unable to do anything on race for fear of being attacked as being a black militant, which the way Obama was treated was abhorrent, and his reaction to this was to have a beer with the officer who did it and Henry Louis Gates. That's an amazing moment in American history, one which we should really study. Like, we should really study that moment because it's an amazing example of how unready America was to talk about race and police violence and black presidents and black intellectuals. It was, it was a perfect storm of all these things. Do you know, if, if, if I said Skippy sat down with a pig, you'd know what I was talking about, right? Because pig is how we say, that's how we have a derogatory term for the police. That's not what the French say. Sacrifice le poulet. The French say chicken. Say poulet. So I don't know. Did I just go on a five minute tangent on this one line thinking that when he's talking about Cambridge Mass, Skippy and poulet, that this little stew, this melting pot that's represented by this dish also represents this crazy moment of racism in America. Did I go too far? Did I just pull this out of my A triple S? I don't know. I don't, maybe, maybe I'll run into Mike Ladd in Paris sometime and I can ask him. He also references Sebastian Munster, calls him a lying bastard, made an early kind of series of maps. He ends it with bless that day and damn the last three centuries, putting everything more into this context of this historical oppression of black people across the world. Is this gonna be my longest video? It might be. 
<laughs> the nice part is I don't have to grade. God, I hate grading. Just, you know what you did. <laughs> okay. Heavy Water is another posse track, but I think a much better posse cut because everything's a lot more integrated, like the, the lines go together. It segues so nicely from the previous song that it sounds almost like the same thing, kind of a piano played on octaves with some jazzy drums. Breeze Brewing, another artist I don't know, has a very nice opening line. Nick of Time, Kick a Rhyme, Tell Em We Know. Yelling Wanna Try Trick the Hood, Whip Em Good, Devo. Just, just a really well done line. Weaves In and Out, LP comes in, speaking of Boston. Uh, speaking of white Boston dudes, um, like me, just, he's always great. Like LP is always great. And, uh, it's, it's a pretty cool thing to say about somebody that he's never not good. I mean, I suppose Killer Mike is the same way. That's why Run the Jewels is so good. It's like they never take a verse off, right? It's all stab in the back, A2 Brute, Bruteers. You know, the reference to, to A2 Brute and the reference to, to Caesar uh, and to Shakespeare. Sort of that kind of uh, witty uh, references is what we're used to from LP. And then Billy ends the whole thing with this amazing line, Ashanti gold on Queen Elizabeth neck, scarification across both breasts. That like the gold that is worn by Queen Elizabeth belonged to the African, the Ashanti. And then that's where the gold came from. And so it's like scarification across her breasts. <sighs> Great guitars at the end, some flute. It's just really the whole album, like next level instrumentation samples. Which then leads into the next song, Harlem, with two A's. When I was in college, I had this idea. See, I studied the Northern Renaissance. You know, people like Rembrandt. Again, take art history, would you? Uh, criminal justice or psychology. Study art history, God damn it. It's so interesting. So I had this idea of spending six months in Harlem in, in Holland and then spending six months in Harlem in America and writing a book about both Renaissances, about both the Harlem Renaissance and the Renaissance, Northern Renaissance in Harlem. I didn't do it because I was a coward and I, was in, I, was, I had a girlfriend. Um, but I think finally, Billy Woods is basically doing that with this album and with this thing, kind of tying together these ideas. A very simple sample, kind of guitar based, sort of reminds me almost like of the Batman theme, just in the way the, the, the chords are in relationship to each other. Okay, so, so okay, let's get going here. We got more to go through. I told you this is a rough draft. I told you this is a rough draft. <sighs> Start, okay, starts off with King of All Blacks, I Eat Human Hearts. I think that's a Howard Stern reference um, to a character called King of All Blacks, which is interesting itself. And then he has this whole line, Fire Leap from Perry's Black Ark. He's referring directly to Lee Scratch Perry right here. And this is a section of the album which Lee Scratch Perry is found all over the place. We just had the, 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 the song which he produced, the Bob Marley song which he produced, which is quoted in, the pre in a song a couple of songs ago. Here we have a reference to Black Ark, Lee Perry's or studio and production. Slash and burn, the past is never far. Reaching with chopped arms, lopped hands, no spare parts. The band played, those were the days I watched them hang. I ate red red in the stadium stands from crum crumbling balustrades. I watched them dance like drill rappers. And then, you know, and then there's more movies from this. There's more quotes from the movie from Congi's Harvest kind of a funny line about lighting a Dutch in Harlem, just sort of a kind of silly joke, kind of like my idea of doing the six months in Harlem in Harlem. And then just more of the quotes from this movie. The will of the state is supreme. The will of the state is supreme. And what's interesting is this leads into a beat change. And if you watch the movie, it's directly lifted from the end of the movie into the credits. It's somebody saying the will of the state is supreme. I'm not going to say who is saying that because that's the biggest spoiler. The movie itself is based on an amazing ending that I'm not going to spoil for you. The lighting is getting kind of intense outside. It's a long video. I, I can't count. I can't count on it not getting cloudy. That's okay. But then it goes into this like avant-garde piano sound, which is just a straight up quote, just lifted directly from the movie. I don't mean to sample snitch, but <laughs> I can't help it. And there's a whole quote of this foreign journalist that's in the movie. Again, like, 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 you know how much fun it is to watch uh, like Kung Fu movies, you know, and like see the quotes where the Wu-Tang Clan movies come from, you know, choose the ball and you join your mother in death. You know, like when you actually see that in context, it's great. 
All you have to do is watch this one movie and you're going to enjoy this Billy Woods uh, album so much more. We then get to the song Versailles, which has a kind of reggae opening, the sound of sirens. I think this is intentionally trying to sound Lee Scratch Perry-esque. I don't know if it's an actual Lee Scratch Perry quote, kind of a triumphant uh, organ sound. And this is the thing. When I say Versailles, what do you think of? Do you think of Louis XIV's beautiful palace? I hope you do. You know, this is, one of, this is the best book about, about Versailles and about, and about uh, Louis XIV by Jean-Marie Apostolides. Very graduate level stuff, but um, I saw this guy speak once and it was like, I have never been more blown away by a public speech. Like, I was like a total fanboy. And he was just like giving a talk at Stanford. And I was just like, oh God, how does he make such points? Like, like when I'm talking, my goal is to reach Apostolides level. Anyways, but what's Versailles really about? Versailles is, what I tell my students is you should go to Versailles, it's beautiful. But just remember, every square inch is covered in blood. <laughs> Colbert was the finance minister of Louis XIV who helped really ensure that France knew how to make money off of the, the slave trade, off of the triangular slave trade. He figured it out. That's the empire. That's the empire was built off of Louis XIV and Colbert wrote a code called the Black Code about slavery that like ensured how slavery would be done across the French Empire. Okay? Like, that's what happened. That's the history of Versailles. Versailles is a beautiful palace that is covered every inch in blood this thick. It is a goddamn Kubrick horror show. That's great to go. Look at Le Nôtre's, uh, uh, you know, his, his work on the gardens. They have all these beautiful shrubs that are covered in blood. So it's a very interesting idea because empires are built on exploitation. In this case, it's not about Versailles. There's no reference to Louis XIV. It's about capitalism building empires. It's about capitalism exploiting. It's about the myth of the American dream. It's about the myth of becoming rich. Billy Woods' verse, end of the day, day traders make minimum wage, pennies on the dollars once it's all said and paid. Somebody made a killing, I just dug the, dug the grave, capital gains and gains and gains and gains. Talking about the myth of being able to make money off of Wall Street because you end up making minimum wage. Then, contracts voided, Muhammad Atta flying the ointment, it's hot in the streets, monsieur, I might shoot an Arab if it's hot on the beach, the plug just jet to Paris. All this is coming again. Just like we had in doldrums, we had this parallel between sort of exploitation and colonization. He's making a direct reference to The Stranger by Camus. I would hold up a copy of The Stranger by Camus, but my daughter is reading it in French right now. 14-year-old daughter. Remember what I said about, about professor's kids? I can brag about my kids, right? No, it's not the place for it. It's not the place for it. I don't have a copy for it, but it is important because the novel is fascinating. Camus himself is interesting. He lived and grew up in Algeria when it was still a part of France and the decolonization of Algeria is an amazing story and his story about killing an Arab is interesting because, and I don't know if this is intentional. I'm, gonna, I'm always gonna give Billy Woods the credit. George Bush Jr the warmonger who invaded Iraq. He was once asked, what was the last book that you read? And he said, I read The Stranger by Camus. And they said, really, that surprises me. And he looked at the camera and gave it a little wink. And he kind of goes like, you gotta make sure they always underestimate you. Which to me was like a, oh-ish. <laughs> this whole time he's been playing rope-a-dope. <laughs> Cause you know, um, the story is partly about the existential angst of this primary character, Marceau, and he ends up killing an Arab, sort of randomly, uh, sort of the meaninglessness of life, the absurdity of life. But let's just say I don't want my president, who frankly illegally and under false pretenses invaded a country filled um, <laughs> with, uh, you know, filled with people and who is making a habit of prosecuting and jailing and torturing Arabs, I don't want that to sort of slyly, I don't want there to be a sly nod to being like, yeah, I really like killing Arabs. 
So that previous reference to Muhammad Atta, one of the 9-11 hijackers, I think is all intentional, kind of putting this all together in these themes of sort of state violence as justified by uh, acts of terrorism. I told you it's a rough draft. <laughs> The second verse is also great uh, by is it Despot, yeah, another act, another rapper I don't know. One in a million makes a killing off the curb, 99,999 in the dirt. So here we have a direct correlation between people trying to make money on the stock market and people trying to make money selling drugs. But in reality, they all fail. They all eat ish. They all just eat it because it's only going to be the top 1% that's ever going to make any money. Kind of a reggae outro, sounds like a toaster, an like old style you know, uh, spoken word Jamaican thing. I thought it was you, Roy. It might be Shinehead who's on the next album, on the next song. We get to the song Proto Evangelion, a very cool kind of reggae. Again, like this album is so seamless that the reggae songs are put together, but they're not like super reggae songs. Like There's just kind of hints of it. Uh, the chorus here is all done by Shinehead. Now there's a bomb at the end of this fuse, and now we're bringing it to you live, Ghetto Network News, going back to the original purpose of hip-hop, in in as it was seen by a lot of people, was very simply to be the voice of the ghetto. I don't know what this song is about at all. It seems to be about the game, about rappers. I'm not quite sure. I'm going to move on. If you have thoughts about Proto Evangelion, please tell me in the comments. That's another thing. My comment section, like I say this is a rough draft, my comment section is the best. People do not ish post on my comments. They don't. They show up and they, they like correct me. They'll, they'll like point something out that I say wrong and I'll, I'll be like, cool, good point. Or like I might misspeak because I just talk. For, I've, I've been talking for an hour with like no cuts. <laughs> so I might have said something wrong, right? Capital of Canada is Toronto. You know, feel free to correct me on anything I might say wrong, okay? Um, but, uh, but my comment section is filled with the most intelligent people on YouTube. So look down there, read, like try and see what people are saying. And if you're out there and you have something to say about this album, use my channel. Let, let this be like a, a place for discussion. I read every comment. I, I totally don't respond to hardly any of them because I'm not good at responding, but I read every comment and they mean a lot. Oh, and smash the like button and subscribe. Uh, Remorseless is the next song, nice kind of flute beat with a swirling keyboard. An interesting, bizarre line. I treat African proverbs like Vegas flyers, like mixing together the sort of the high and the low, like African proverbs should have this great weight, but he just discards them like flyers given out at, in, in Las Vegas to try to get you to go somewhere to gamble. And then he has an amazing, so we're, we're now going to close out the album on questions of generational inheritance. Maybe tying back together again with the F23 and me. So, sorry, I lost where I was. Yes. In person, these rappers' watches look tempting. The chain say envy, but PTSD keep me counting never spending. So he's talking about being in poverty, being in hard situations, which means instead of spending money, he saves it. My accountant is a head full of bad memories and sad endings. God damn, this guy's a good poet. Okay, my accountant is a head full of bad memories and sad endings? Hey, Charles Bukowski, you suck. <laughs> okay, okay, I like Charles Bukowski. Charles Bukowski's written a lot of good stuff, but Nothing better than my accountant is a head full of bad memories and sad endings. And this guy isn't some, oh, I'm a drunk poser. Why am I, why am I mad at Bukowski all of a sudden? I'm fine. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying this is a great line. And it's so lost in the ocean of great lines on this album that I'm just going to take one more time to say it again. My accountant is a head full of bad memories and sad endings. It's all payments pending. I'm not concerned with generational wealth. That's its own curse. Anything you want on this cursed earth, probably better off getting it yourself. See what it's worth. So going back to that line about the children of the slaveholders all looking the same and looking miserable and the sense that it's not worth passing on generational wealth, that you have to work for it. So the curse of generational wealth is not just the curse of slavery, but also perhaps the curse of exploitation from capitalism that allows you to get wealth. Or perhaps it's just the idea that the only way to have value is to learn what value is, is to figure out what things are worth. And then at the end of this, the voice is kind of screaming. So he's kind of making a direct attack on the nature of capitalism, of accruing a lot of wealth and making sure that your kids are rich and have enough money to do cool things and 
you know, to, to, to not have to work in high school so they can sit at home reading Camus, right? But then you think Billy Woods is dumb, but he's not done because he's smarter than all of us. He has an entire verse attacking socialism, not socialism. Don't forget, like his dad is like a, I must be like a super important communist revolutionary, right? Please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. I think that's the case. He's attacking the kind of socialist that you know on this platform all too well. Bourgeois socialists. Spare me the hallmark Karl Marx. I was in the Dollar Tree break room playing cards with quarters. Stop loss posters on the wall, brick and mortar. I watched the planet from orbit remorseless. The hallmark Karl Marx, the kind of fake bourgeois socialism and communism that comes from people who have that inherited wealth, that generational wealth, who can talk about the plight of the working person without having to be the working person because he was in a Dollar Tree break room. Like the worst place you can think to work is a Dollar Tree, a place where everyone who's there is only there because they're in a state of poverty themselves. And then you're sitting there, you're working there in the break room playing cards with quarters. Like he's just playing cards. He's trying to get out of his life, but he's also wasting his money gambling. Stop loss posters on the walls. That means stop stealing. That means they're afraid of the employees stealing from themselves, the lack of trust, the way that workers are treated and exploited and, and seen as enemies by the corporations that own their contracts that own their workers, two African men, brick and mortar, I watch the planet from orbit, remorseless. I don't know. I feel like this is a reference to, uh, to aliens, where they say nuke the planet, nuke it from orbit. I get the sense that this is like just about destroying the whole planet because who cares about capitalism? Who cares about communism? We're all just, we are all in a state. I am currently in my office, but in another real way, I'm in a Dollar Tree break room playing cards with quarters with a stop loss poster on the wall, brick and mortar. And he's just remorseless because he's remorseless to see this all go away. And then again, the voice is screaming. And then it ends with more quotes from Kangi's Harvest. And I haven't been giving you all the quotes from Kangi. This is Kangi's Harvest all over this album. Another time it was talking about like, the price of, um, there's a whole reference to uh, royal blood, which comes from the movie. Uh, there's a reference to the prices, the gallows, which comes from this movie. And here it's a whole bunch of decrees given by the dictator, this kind of ridiculous decrees upon decrees upon decrees. The album ends with Smith and Cross. This sounds like an outro, a kind of flute and a droning orchestra strings, with kind of guitar. And this is the thing with underground hip hop, which I've been noticing, like, they almost always have at least one song with a wailing guitar somewhere in it, and it's usually at the end. Um, it's weird. The emotional affair was the best intoxicating. Let's not ruin it with sex. I'm not really sure what that's about. But then what's interesting here is later. Temple Grandin, keep the cattle calm. Side saddle took Carrie to the prom. <laughs> so Temple Grandin is one of the great heroes of the 21st century. I mean, she did a, she's highly autistic. And she used her intelligence and her voice to make the world better for autistic people, for helping them get what they need in terms of physical touch and physical comfort. And then she also happened to realize a better way to treat cattle, like how to better coddle cattle before you put a bolt cutter in their brain and kill them. So that's an interesting question. Is that really a good thing? Or is that just papering over the savagery of killing the cattle? Side Saddle took Carrie to the prom. Um, I think that's a direct reference to, to Stephen King. Again, kind of Christine Stephen King. And then later, Fire in the Cane Fields, Generational Trauma. So it's not a coincidence. See, this whole album is so linked. I'm, I'm turning into Charlie Day and with the, 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 the strings. Everything's all connected. I'm that meme with all the numbers coming out at you, except instead of numbers, it's Billy Woods and Preservation's ability to to create cross song connections. So we had that whole kind of reggae connection. And then here we're into this generational question where the last song said, I don't care about generational wealth, but here we have generational trauma, which all ties in together with the F 23 and me, which all ties in together to this cover with two African men, which ties back to the centuries of exploitation, the centuries of generational trauma. And in reality, when we talk about the, di the African diaspora and Africa, there's very little generational wealth. 
there is very much generational trauma. These words are used in different songs on the same album next to each other, and I am positive there's a straight line thematically from one to the other. At the museum, eyes glassy from the pain pills, me and her in the diorama. So we're back at a museum. I think it's intentional again. We're not, we're not at the Maurice Huys Museum in, in Holland. We're not having a Dutch, we're not smoking a Dutch in Amsterdam, okay? We're not there. We're at a natural history museum where often you will have Africans in a diorama. Weirdly glamorized, exoticized people. Now, I said I was going to talk about exoticism. You know, so this is Rousseau, an 18th century philosopher. Great guy, did a lot of good work on inequality and really helped lay a lot of the, a lot of the groundwork for democracy and all that stuff. But he also, when he would talk about savages, he would talk about them as being beautiful and important. And he sort of glorified them. And paradoxically, by treating the savages as something special, as something better than the civilized human, the civilized human, he ended up creating the situation where we could other them to the point where we could kill them. And that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about exoticism always being a problem. Now, I was exotic once. Okay? When I lived in southern France, I was a six foot one pale dude. And I was living in, on the Mediterranean where most people are not six foot and most people aren't pale. So I experienced exoticism on the other side where people would be like, wow, look at that guy. Uh, when, I went to, when I went to Japan, uh, multiple people stopped me on the street and asked me if I was Brad Pitt. I mean, <laughs> I had long hair, so I was kind of Legends of the Fall, but I, <laughs> I wasn't that Legends of the Fall, you know? Exoticism isn't limited to one race, but in any case, it's always a question of othering. So what does that all tie into this verse here? Me and her in the diorama. So what's interesting is, they are at the museum looking at the diorama and they have glassy eyes from, from drug abuse, from pain pills, but also dioramas, they have glass eyes. That's it. The, the Africans in the Museum of, of Natural History have glass eyes. It's this whole history of dehumanizing, othering, and this weird mixture of calling someone a savage or calling them a a noble savage, or calling them a cannibal, or calling them a spirit of the earth, all of it in service of exploitation and getting money and being able <laughs> to pass on generational wealth through inflicting generational trauma. That should be the slogan of, <laughs> of our country. That should be the slogan. Accruing generational wealth by inflicting generational trauma. The United States of America. Right? God damn it. Hour and 12 minutes, I swear to God, none of you are still here. I don't blame you. I don't blame you for not being here, but that's like maybe the most clever thing I've, I've said on this channel. So I'm gonna take a sip of water before I finish up this video. An amazing course, sugar, molasses, rum, which are three things which all tie into the triangular slave trade. Sugar is, was the main, one of the main crops of slavery. Part of the reason that France got so rich and was able to build Versailles was because of what was happening in Saint-Domingue, which would then later be called Haiti. You know, sugar turns into molasses, and then molasses turns into rum, and the slaves would often drink the rum, and like the rum would be sold, and the sugar, and the molasses, and the whole triangular slave trade was based on harvesting sugar and turning it into molasses and turning it into rum. The whole thing, that's the whole, the whole history. So there we go. There's my review, my rough draft of Billy Woods and Preservation's great album. Uh, I do have a Patreon and I started doing a new thing where instead of like showing all the names every time, I do it like at least once a week, just for specific albums, I ask if anyone wants a specific shout out for a specific album. Cause you know, I cover a lot of different music. So people who want to see me do Weezer aren't necessarily the same people who want to see me do Billy Woods. So I'm just going to give a shout out to, to four of my, uh, Four of my Patreons here, Claudio West, Dread Lee, Ben Hansen, and At Large Auteur. So, the, sorry, this weird focus thing, I can't tell. So thank you for supporting my channel and for encouraging me to do this. Okay, what time is it now? It is 
10.30. Good. I have an hour before I have to go to a uh, bias and diversity lunch. So, it's good. Till next time, there's the camera.